So good afternoon, uh, buenas tardes. A pleasure to be here. My, my second big things. In fact, the first time I was here, it was called Big Data Spain, I think. So nice to see them continuing to grow uh, and, and evolve. Uh, and thank you for joining my session. I know you have a choice of sessions. For th thanks for choosing mine. And what I want to talk about uh, for the next 20 minutes or so is how Twitter data can form an important part of your customer experience program, letting you know uh, your customers and consumers in general at a more deeper level, and while also surfacing interesting trends and, and consumer behaviors along the way. So as said, uh, I'm Joe Rice. That's me and my wife, and I am part of Twitter's developer enterprise solutions team. We are uh, a small but mighty band of professionals who work with uh, organizations of many shapes and sizes, helping them to get value and insight from our data, and doing so across uh, a multitude of different uh, use cases, a couple of which I will be discussing today. And I'm at Joseph L. Rice, by the way, uh, if you want to connect questions Comments, complaints, always, always very welcome. So here we go. So our story begins with a small clay tablet dating from about 1750 BC and what is believed to be the first documented customer service complaint. And the tablet describes how a customer named Nani has procured some copper ore from someone called Ia Nasir now, unfortunately, the, the quality of the ore delivered did not meet expectations, uh, and it was delivered late, so, so Nani was not particularly happy. Uh, it doesn't talk to us much about how it was rectified or if it was rectified, so we'll have to hope that there was some restitution for, for Nani. But what it does, I think, highlight is that going back thousands of years, the idea of, of customer satisfaction a fairness of delivering on our promises has been important to us. And yet, we have to fast forward to the mid 20th century and the rise of consumerism to see businesses, organizations, finally take customer experience seriously. And they've done so mainly because of competitive advantage. They have realized, they realized that uh, if you treated your customers well, they were more likely to spend money with you. No, no surprise there. And they also realized that in the era of the of the consumer, of choice and empowerment, uh, they needed to do a much better job of understanding their customers, their preferences, their interests, unmet needs. Um, and as a result, you saw a rise of um, market research and feedback techniques to, to better understand those consumers. Now today, we live in a world of, of big data and analytics, and that's, that's all the rage, all the, the conversations for the next two days. We have measurements such as NPS and CSAT. Um, but if you look at most, most companies' uh, customer experience programs and how they really learn about their, their, their customers and consumers in general, they're using methodologies that have been around nearly 50 years now, namely the survey and the focus group. And yet, we have changed. The world has changed. Uh, the digital revolution changed everything, so we moved we moved uh, online in, in a big way, where we're spending about a quarter of our day now. And increasingly, we're spending that time on our mobile devices, our tablets and, and smartphones. And of that time uh, online uh, and, on, and mobile, we're increasingly spending a lot of time on social, interacting with, with one another, but also brands and organizations. So as a result of all this, what we see now is that Customers are sharing their experiences, their moods, their mindsets, and they're doing so just about every minute of every day and in real time. And make no mistake, these are your customers, and that move online and to social has fundamentally changed customer experience and how we understand it and how we measure it and how we, how we, we respond to it. So understanding that and understanding how we're currently dealing with customer experience, clearly some things need to change. We, we haven't kept up with these changes and consumer behavior and these, these usage patterns. Um, so what about those, those existing uh, uh, programs, surveys, and the like? Well, if you are into surveys, if you're surveying your customer base, take note. Today we are seeing uh, about a 2% response rate, give or take, and that's down from 20% uh, 
at the turn of the century. So a pretty, a pretty steep decline in, in um, response rates or participation rates. It's actually quite interesting. You would have thought with the rise of the web, people coming online, it would be easier than ever for uh, people to provide feedback, right? It's easy, it's frictionless, a couple clicks, some, some responses, and off you go. Um, but in fact, as you can see, the opposite has been true. And why? Well, um, a lot of people report that it interferes with the web experience. And as we know today, you go onto a website, you accept cookies, you sign up for the newsletter, um, you're asked to take the survey, and then a chat pops up from someone named Joe who wants to help you, right? So it is, it is a mess, and, and obviously people um, don't like it. We also know that 80% of people have said that they've, they've abandoned uh, a survey uh, halfway through, and 60% of people have said that they wouldn't even attempt to complete a survey longer than three minutes. So clearly we we now have the attention span of, of two-year-olds, and no surprise that organizations aren't getting the feedback uh, that they need, the real-time feedback they need. And what about focus groups, then? Another tried and, and tested uh, approach to getting feedback, uh, understanding something. So focus groups are, are amazing at the why. Why do people feel the way they do about certain topics? Uh, the only challenge with them is the time. You need to recruit the panelists who are representative or roughly representative of, of, your, of your thing, your product, your service. Um, you didn't need to have the panel. You need to interpret and analyze those results. And so as a result, that takes time and with that, money. And so focus groups don't scale particularly well. You can only do so many of them in a given time period. So given the, the shortcomings and challenges with these traditional methods, what is the CX practitioner to do then? Well, the good news uh, is that people are still communicating and sharing their experiences. In fact, they're doing it more than ever, but they're doing it in different places. Um, so what if instead of chasing customers around a website or an inbox or your store, what if you could listen in to what they're already saying, what they're expressing? Well, you can do that, actually. And you can do that on Twitter, no surprise, where every day hundreds of millions of tweets are sent uh, about anything and everything, which is why we like to think of it as the world's largest focus group. And believe it or not, due to the open nature of Twitter, it represents the largest publicly available, searchable archive of human-generated thought that has ever existed. So an incredible amount of insight into the world around us, insight that touches just about, just about every aspect of our lives. And we think that insight is so valuable and so unique for a couple of reasons. One, it's unprompted, so it's unsolicited uh, advice or feedback. Secondly, it's in the moment. So it's when people are actually having that, uh, that experience, right? It's not some cold, um, sterile focus group where you're being asked to recount your experiences with a brand um, uh, outside of, that, of the context that you would, you would have that sort of experience. And then finally, uh, it's authentic. So it's how people actually communicate. It is literally the voice of the customer. And so as a result of those things, what we find is that it's quite raw and it's, it's emotional. We say Twitter is true emotion captured. So what could we do on a practical level? What could we do with, with those, those features, if you will? How, what could we learn about the world? Well, one thing we could do is we could do a better job of understanding our customers' experience with our brands and our, and our products and services. That's that, that customer journey. And along the way, see frictions in the process, what influences them, and so on and so forth. So if we took a, a uh, uh, retail banking, uh, should be something that we all have some experience with, uh, we see that people turn to Twitter a lot to get, to get advice and feedback. In this case, Emily here says she's looking for a, a, retail, a student retail bank and asking for, uh, for some advice. As you can see, 430 comments, so she got a lot of advice. Be careful what you wish for. Um, and we see the feedback start to come in. Teza here, Santander, free, free rail card. And another one. Yeah. 
uh, busy bee. My daughter has just opened one with HSBC, 100,000 overdraft with 0% APR, and she also got 100 quid. So, so happy days. So with just two, two responses there, two tweets, we're already starting to see the attributes of a successful or a good student banking account, whatever, again, whatever, whatever that means. So we start to see these features and functionality that come out, the people um, that, are, that are interesting to people. And then past the, the recommendations, we assume that Emily goes forward and, and um, uh, signs up to a bank. We also see commentary around the registration process. In this case, Susan saying, I know I'm late to the game, but impressed with how quick and seamless Monzo's sign-up UX is. All the kudos. So important part there around onboarding and registration part of, the, of that journey. And then finally, once you're, you are a, a customer, you would expect the customer service coming in, and we see all kinds of that on, on Twitter, which has become a huge, huge and important platform for customer care. Stuart here, another reason why I love using Monzo, great customer service, spoke to them this morning and got a problem I had sorted within half an hour via their in-app chat. Thanks, Brenda. So just four tweets to give you a, an idea um, of the kind of feedback that you know, we see on the platform every day. Last week in the UK, to give you an idea, there were about 1,500 tweets on retail banking alone. So there's a huge amount of information out there at just about any stage in, in the customer journey, regardless of what your customer journey is. Uh, but you have to be ready, you have to be willing and, and, and ready to, to listen and act. Another thing you could do with these insights is spot a problem or an issue uh, as it's happening and before it becomes a bigger problem, issue, or crisis. In this case, it's OnePlus, the, the, uh, the handset maker, and they launched the OnePlus 6 uh, handset uh, over a year ago now, and they noticed immediately some negative sentiment around, uh, around the phone. And what was interesting was it was around the notch feature, and that is the, the move today with smartphones where you see the the, 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 um, the camera and the speaker taking up part of the screen. You see that on the iPhones as well. And, and people weren't actually um, specifically upset about that notch, but the fact that it was impacting the, the games and the apps they were using. And the apps had not been updated yet to take into, take into account that. And so um, OnePlus saw that sentiment and reacted. And within two and a half weeks, had pushed a patch allowing you to turn off that that, that feature, and turn off the, the notch feature. Um, shrinking the screen a little bit, but allowing your, your apps and games to, to display as normal. And of course, no surprise, people were, were both happy they did that and happy to see that they were quite responsive in the process. So again, just a quick example of spotting issues, consumer issues, and acting before it's, it's too late, and before they become a bigger issue. Another thing you can do is identify unmet consumer needs. Now, this is a, a use case um, that I don't have a huge amount of experience with, if I'm honest, but my understanding is that women can find it very difficult to find concealer to match their skin tone. And this is um, especially true of, of women with darker skin tones, women of color. Um, and again, you find, uh, you find the big con uh, many conversations on Twitter about that, women turning to Twitter to talk about um, the challenges, uh, making recommendations, asking for advice. So a real, a real sense of community uh, around this one issue of, of the concealer. Um, so clearly there was a need there, um, an opportunity for, uh, for an organization. And in steps none other than, excuse me, Rihanna. Is there anything she, she can't do? Um, and she launched her Fenty Beauty line and in 50 shades, not of gray, but of concealer. And uh, eight of which were, were uh, formulated, colored for, uh, for women with darker skin tones. So um, identifying a need and, and addressing it. Now, of course, there was lots of positive sentiment and reaction to this. Um, but more interestingly, I guess, is the results. And in the first year of trading uh, for Fenty Beauty, 20, 2018, they had 573 million dollars in revenue. So clearly, the people were, were, were voting with their, with their pocketbooks. And that business today, by the way, is valued at about $3 billion. So 
It's a huge opportunity. Twitter was not the only way, by the way, that they knew that there was an opportunity uh, here, right? There are many data sources out there, uh, but it was quite clear that something needed to be done. And again, it highlights, and something I'll talk about a bit later, Twitter is a great complement to, to many data sources. Moving on there, uh, the final, final case study here, identifying the next big thing and finding the unknown unknowns. So I mentioned earlier that anything and everything is discussed on the platform. And that, that's true of uh, lots of topics that are quite esoteric or, or niche. Um, and the challenge um, is how do you, how do you figure out well, what is a, a passing fad or something that's actually sustainable and, and a trend here, here to stay? And with advances in, in natural language processing um, and AI, uh, you're seeing uh, us be able to do a better job of making these predictions. And in this case, we worked with a company called Black Swan to help predict that uh, matcha green tea was going to be something that moved from a very exotic ingredient to one that was viewed as having mainstream health and wellness benefits. And in this specific instance, uh, Lipton rushed the matcha green tea to market, and within five months was the leading uh, tea variant, uh, flavored tea variant in, in the market. So the ability to jump on something quickly and launch a product or service can have, can have meaningful impact to organizations. Stepping away from use cases just for a moment, one of the things we, we see in general from Twitter is, is the rhythms of life and the ebb and flow of, of various conversations. This is the average day on Twitter. What's interesting is you can see how things come to life. Business starts off strong uh, in the morning and as the day goes on, starts to fade and really you know, ends at around eight. Something like gaming, by the way, picks up, no surprise, uh, after school and after work, and, and goes strong and goes late. Or something like movies, uh, television, that tends to be a pursuit uh, after dinner, right? So the rhythms of life, we see it every day on the platform. Um, and not just on the week, by the way, or on, excuse me, on the day, but we can also look across, across the week. Um, we can look at a basket of topics. In this case, topics that um, you could loosely associate with healthiness or indulgence. And if we map that across uh, an average week, what you see is that we're doing so well, and then Thursday afternoon comes and everything goes to shit and does not recover till, till Sunday night where we repeat the process. And I'm certainly, I'm certainly quite uh, probably guilty of this as well. Uh, and it's not just the week we see, but it's the seasons. Um, and tis the season now. We are, uh, Christmas is, is not that far away, amazingly. And we know that Christmas is a time of excitement, but also stress, because we see that in the tweets. Um, and there is a point where the excitement turns to stress, and there is no return, quite frankly. Um, and but looking at that graph, I think it's today, quite frankly. Uh, it happens in late November. That could be approximately today. Um, and, and why? Well, because of, of shopping and, and, and that whole ordeal and thinking through the gifts for the kids and what you're going to cook and having your mother-in-law over and, and the like. Um, in this case, what we see is, is in the red here, uh, people who haven't done their shopping and are, are tweeting about it. Those in green who have finished their, their shopping and, and are, are clearly gloating uh, over that. And you can see as the time moves on um, how the, the pressure ramps. Uh, in the green there, you can see the, the weekends start to appear in, in the tweet volume. And then finally, in the, the, very, uh, the very bitter end, the, the absolute sheer panic buyers, um, like myself, who realize they need to get out before Christmas Day. And then, of course, it tails off. So we see many of these, these themes on the platform based on what people tweet. And again, um, as technology improves, the ability to, 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 to bucket, to classify things, we're getting much better at seeing these, these rhythms of life and the, the, the temperature of, of, of certain topics uh, in certain places. I want to point out, uh, finally, that um, Twitter data, I've, I've, I've kind of knocked surveys and focus groups. Um, they certainly have their place. Um, Twitter data is not a replacement for those methods, but rather uh, a complement to them. We think 
Twitter data blended with those traditional methods allows you to understand your customers at a much more deeper level, to, 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 to surface uh, interesting uh, consumer trends, predict interesting consumer trends. And often Twitter is a place where those things are surfaced first. So an, an early warning detection system that there's an interest here or an issue, issue there. And that's very much how we see those, those two things working together, the, the social and the traditional. I should add that um, a lot of that innovation happens from our partners. So we have an official partner program uh, of, of social listening, social analytics tools that can, that can help you do some of that. Brandwatch, Sprinkler, Sprout being, being three of them. Um, but we're also trying to do a much better job, of a much better proactive job at supporting organizations who have questions about how to get insight and, and value from Twitter data. Um, so if you do have an interest, please reach out to insights at twitter.com. You can, you can tweet at me, you can DM me, and that data.twitter.com has a host of different uh, case studies, some use cases, lots of, lots, of cool, lots of cool things to help you get started. And finally, I just wanted to say your customers um, are talking. Are you ready to listen? And thanks for listening to me. <laughs>